And just before I hand things over to Kara, a little background of, to this webinar is that I asked Kara and Justine to do an in-house webinar for cost on ceramic putt filters because within cost, we like to keep staff up to date on household water treatment and safe storage technologies that they might encounter in the field and also on recent developments around these technologies. But then given the extent of the ceramic pot filter manufacturing and implementation worldwide, we realized that, of course, there's a much broader audience that we could reach and who'd be interested. And then beyond that, um, there's the fact that efforts around quality control for ceramic pot filters could also be helpful for those who are involved in any locally produced household water treatment and safe storage technologies. And so we're really glad to see such a diverse audience that has joined us today, and we'll hope that you find this webinar helpful. Uh, and with that, I will hand things over to Kara. All right. I will show my screen. Can Can you hear me, Laura? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. All right, and my screen is showing up? Yep, you're all set. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction and, and everyone for attending. Um, I wanted to start with just a brief outline of my presentation. Um, I wanted to go over some uh, background information on the filter and on Potters for Peace. Um, as Laura said, I'll address the challenges and some keys to successful factory establishment, followed by some challenges and keys to successful factory operation. Um, and then I briefly just want to discuss uh, Potters for Peace's strategy moving forward. Um, and then if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but I think we're going to wait until after Justine's presentation uh, to answer all of the questions, but please feel free to submit. Um, so as most of you probably know, the ceramic pot filter uh, system consists of a ceramic filter pot, a lidded receptacle with a spigot, and the receptacle can be either plastic or uh, ceramic, and, and some type of instructional uh, guide. This can be a sticker or it can be silk screened onto the receptacle itself, but the general idea is to give the user an idea um, how to use their filter properly and how to clean their filter properly. Um, and this is done both uh, with pictures and hopefully in the local language. The primary targets of removal for the ceramic pot filter are bacteria, protozoa, and turbidity. The average lifespan of a filter is about two years. Uh, we do recommend replacing a filter after about two years. And this recommendation is based on a um, study that came out in 2006 that showed about a 2% monthly disuse rate. So after about two years, 50% um, of the filters are still working and in use in the field. Um, so we do recommend a replacement after about two years. The flow rate of the filter um, should be between about 1 and 3 liters per hour, and this is sufficient to provide enough drinking water, safe drinking water, for a family of six. Um, in terms of requirements for filter production, um, we recommend in terms of raw materials a good clay source, a burnout material, this can be either sawdust or rice husk, nanoparticle silver, and water. In terms of equipment, uh, the primary equipment, of course, we, we recommend using safety equipment at all times. Um, you need a hammer mill, sieves, uh, industrial mixer, a filter press, and aluminum molds, and a kiln. And there are several different uh, styles of kiln that are available to use. And then finally, we recommend working with skilled potters. Um, this isn't absolutely required, but we find it to be really beneficial. Um, skilled potters tend to have access to local markets. Um, they may already have some of the equipment needed, like a pug mill uh, for production, and uh, they generally know where to get um, many of the raw materials needed, like a, a good clay source. So the first step in production is uh, processing raw materials. You want to dry the clay um, and the sawdust and mill those, uh, typically in a hammer mill, to remove, uh, break them up and remove big pieces of debris. Um, and then you want to sieve the, both the sawdust and the clay to control the particle size. Next, you mix the clay, the burnout material, and the water in an industrial mixer. 
you wedge the clay into a ball, weigh it out, um, and then press it. Presses can be either uh, manual press using a truck rack, like that shown in the picture here, um, or they can be hydraulic electric. Um, and then you dry the filter, and drying can take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, depending on the climate that you're working in. Next, you fire the filter in a kiln up to about 950 degrees Celsius. This is a, an all-day process. And then you run, uh, once the, the filters have cooled and been soaked, you run quality control tests. Um, and this is a picture of flow rate tests being done, where a soaked filter is filled with water um, and left for one hour uh, draining. And you see how much uh, water comes through the filter after one hour. And this would be the, the flow rate. And then finally, uh, the filter is coated with nanoparticle silver. And this is painted onto uh, both the inside and outside of the filter body. So comparing the ceramic pot filter with other household water treatment options, um, there are some advantages. Um, for example, it is uh, produced locally. It can be produced in uh, just about any location where, where clay is found, which is all over the world. And it, re it reduces diarrhea um, significantly. And this has been shown in a number of studies um, over the past few decades. Um, but more recently has been shown, uh, reaffirmed in two and a second by Clausen and all in 2015. And I'm not sure how many of you saw uh, the recent memorandums put out um, as a joint effort by Oxfam and Tufts, um, but they're great if you get a chance to look at them. And the first mem memorandum that they put out was on enteric pathogens and malnutrition. And what the report said was that four of the five pathogens responsible for the majority of diarrheal cases are either bacterial or protozoa, including cryptosporidium, shigella, and two types of E. coli. Um, so I think the reason, uh, there are two main reasons why the ceramic pot filter is so good at reducing diarrhea. Um, the first of those is that it's addressing uh, four of the five pathogens responsible for the majority of diarrhea cases because, as I mentioned before, it does remove bacteria and protozoa um, pretty effectively. Um, and the second reason is um, it tends to have a really high user acceptance. So it's easy to use. Even a kid can use it. Um, but it's also relatively inexpensive as a solution, and it's a tangible object. So compared to, for example, a chlorine packet, um, which is a chemical treatment, um, the filter is actually something that the user can own and put into their to their house and take pride in owning. Um, and so I think that contributes to, to the high user acceptance and why it's so good at reducing diarrhea. <clears throat> it also has a, a very good taste. Um, it adds minerals to the water and creates a cooling effect, and many people like that cooling effect um, for their drinking water. <clears throat> It does have some disadvantages, so the filter can be heavy um, and somewhat difficult to transport. It is somewhat fragile because it's made of ceramic, um, although factories have started to address this um, in terms of shipping pretty well using things like five, five ply cardboard uh, to move the filter from one place to another. So we are improving um, ability to transport the filter, but it is fragile. Um, and it has relatively poor virus removal. So a recent study showed removal of about 90% of viruses, but this is um, far below what you need to really be effective against viruses, which is about 5 log reduction or 99.999% or removal. <clears throat> so I want to move to um, briefly talk about the current Potters for Peace model and how we operate as an organization. We actually don't make, sell, or benefit from filter sales, and we don't fund factories. Instead, we work as consultants. And as consultants, we assist with the organization of uh, factory infrastructure, uh, raw materials, and equipment. We assist with the initiation of filter production. 
Um, we then can help with troubleshooting and technical support for existing factories or newly established factories. And what we found um, using this model is that it, it really fosters self-reliance. So it's, we think it's a pretty sustainable model. Of course, there are problems with it. Um, but we think that, that giving away uh, filter factories can be problematic. And by not funding filter factories and acting more as a consultant, um, we've found this process to be, to be pretty sustainable. And we feel we've done a lot, um, had a large impact with a very small budget over time. So using this model, Potters for Peace has helped establish um, somewhere around 50 factories in about 35 countries over the past decade and a half. So a pretty big impact uh, globally, and we, we hope to continue improving that impact. <clears throat> now I want to move into some of the challenges. Um, like I said, we've been doing this for about a decade and a half, so um, we've run into many challenges in the field. And the first one uh, that came to mind was that frequently we have an initiative to set up a new factory, a new filter factory that's external to the community in need. Um, so we have this disconnect between the funder and the entrepreneur. So a lot of times what that looks like is funding coming from one country. And then you have entrepreneurs in, in many different countries. And the funder um, first has to identify um, that entrepreneur, um, which can be difficult from afar. Um, they then tend to want to donate the money to the entrepreneur um, or, or somehow transfer that, those funds to the entrepreneur. And sometimes they want to also uh, make decisions about the factory um, and, and what goes on there, um, either from afar or from multiple uh, visits to the country. So I think the problems that, that stem from this are that we tend to see um, in these cases where the initiative is external to the community, we tend to see a lack of local ownership and a lack of local management, which can be really problematic. Um, we also tend to see short-term project mentality, um, sometimes on, on both the front of the funder and the entrepreneur. So the funder has uh, funds that they want to use before they dry up, um, and once they kind of get those funds out, there's not a lot of follow-up. So this can be problematic. <clears throat> Another challenge to factory setup, I think, is the underestimated importance of factory scale. So uh, frequently we get um, individuals interested in starting a new factory that don't realize quite the scale of what they're getting into. So they think that this is something they can hand build um, in their backyard um, and maybe use a pit fire in their backyard to, to fire. So uh, pretty frequently we run into uh, folks underestimating the scale of the factory um, as we think it should be. I think folks also uh, sometimes underestimate production complexity. Um, so there have been a ton, um, a, a number of, of really nice documents that have been put together in the last five years or so, um, uh, in part, a lot in part to uh, Justine. Um, and these documents are fantastic at describing um, maintenance and manufacturing uh, of the ceramic water filter. Um, but what we found is despite there being uh, several documents available um, in an open source uh, manner, these documents, whoops, these documents really don't um, equate to uh, working with a consultant, an experienced consultant. So they're fantastic references, um, but, but I think they were never meant, uh, they were never intended to replace a consultant, and, and we think that that's still the case that they shouldn't. Another challenge to factory setup is difficulty obtaining materials and machinery. So a lot of times on the ground we see a lack of experience or a lack of confidence to make decisions. Is this an appropriate uh, hammer mill? Is this an appropriate mixer uh, for filter uh, production? We also see uh, scattered equipment, so folks are, are trying to piece together equipment from a lot of different sources, um, and sometimes the locally sourced items can have a relatively poor quality, 
Um, in, in terms of equipment, this isn't always the case, but um, with things like bricks, this is this is a frequent problem. I've actually had a brick um, that I was promised was fired to 800 degrees Celsius uh, fall to the ground and break open, and there was still grass inside. Um, so, so locally sourced items can have uh, poor quality. Um, it can be difficult to find the high quality items. And then for those items that we want to import, um, such as nano silver or sometimes the filter press and molds, um, we often experience custom issues uh, where these items get stuck in customs and, and you end up paying fees or waiting a long time to get them out. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to go over a couple keys to success um, in terms of factory setup. Um, the first and I think one of the most important is to involve uh, local individuals and have local leadership from the beginning. So it's really hard to go into a community and find um, find someone to lead the project once you've already kind of begun creating the idea. So it's really, really important to get local leadership involved from the beginning of the project. I also think it's important to think big and plan for growth. Um, so we really are trying to push this more as uh, a a production in terms of an industrial mindset. This isn't isn't a backyard project, um, and it's really important for quality control that people approach the filter as a health tool, not as a pottery object, um, and kind of come at it with an industrial mindset from the beginning. And it's important to plan for growth. So um, when you're thinking about infrastructure from the beginning, uh, not to only think about the production level you plan to start with, but how your production level and demand for the filter in the community that you're working in might grow over time. Uh, we also think it's important to work with an experienced consultant, uh, both for uh, an initial site assessment um, in which we can help organize infrastructure and equipment, um, and also for a consultancy um, to initiate filter production. Uh, site assessments generally take a week to ten days, and consultancies uh, generally more like four to five weeks. I want to go uh, quickly into some challenges uh, with respect to factory operation. Um, one challenge we see commonly is variability of quality control, um, and this can stem from anything from contaminants in the filter mix, so uh, this can can be caused by, for example, a hole in your sieve or a hole in your hammer mill screen, um, to improper firing techniques, to inappropriate flow rates. And these can all be problems, um, not if they happen at the factory, but if these filters get out into the field, um, which does happen and, and really gives a bad name to filters globally. So it's really important to focus on, on quality control. Another challenge to factory operation is um, dependence on NGO buyers, and this isn't always the case. Some factories have actually had a lot of success um, in terms of NGO buyers, and they've been able to turn a pretty decent profit uh, by selling to large NGOs. Um, but it does make your sales reliant on external funds, so I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but in the past couple of years, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation actually switched their focus largely from water to sanitation. And so um, when your sales are reliant on external funds, you're susceptible to uh, switches in, in mindsets like this, where, where a lot of the funding for purchasing and distributing filters um, can dry up rather quickly. <clears throat> and then finally, um, uh, a challenge to factory operation is loss of production knowledge. Um, this can be caused from high employee turnover or, uh, for example, raw material source change. And when you have a change in raw materials, which, which does happen occasionally um, in, in factories, and especially in, um, if you've lost some of your skilled employees over time, uh, these can lead to production problems and, and can really put a halt to production uh, at a factory um, that can last for, for a long time. Um, and cause big financial problems at the factory. So um, in terms of factory operation, some keys to success that, that I would recommend. Uh, first of all, a solid product. 
So it's really important to make a high quality filter, um, not only in terms of function, but in terms of, of appearance. So it's important to have a good looking, uh, well functioning filter. It's also important to have a solid marketing plan. Um, the filter should be marketed as an aspirational product, um, not something that, that low income users need for health purposes, um, but I think it's much more successful to market the filter as an aspirational product that can really benefit anybody. Um, and it's nice to offer different receptacle options at different prices. So uh, you can have a lower cost uh, plastic receptacle um, up to a, a, a very high end uh, ceramic receptacle, which is, which is actually a piece of art to have in the household um, and to be proud of. Um, it, can, it can be very beneficial to offer financing for low income users. Um, and this is uh, being made uh, much more possible through uh, the spread of telephones and, and uh, banking systems on telephones is making this, this actually a feasible idea. And uh, finally, and maybe most importantly, I think it's, it's important to have a good distribution chain. So if your spigot breaks or if your filter breaks um, and you want a new one, but don't know where to get one, um, it's a big problem. So it's really important uh, for any factory to have a good distribution chain of filters and filter products um, so that people can replace filters when they do break in the field. Um, and then finally, I think it's, it's important to retain employees. Um, so I always like to sit down with employees during the consultancy and really sell them on the filter mission. What is the filter? Why does it, uh, how does it work, and why is it important? Um, and I really like each, each employee that works at a filter factory to be able to explain to me how the factory, how the filter works, and to be able to really give a tour of the factory and each step of production um, to anybody that comes. Even if that's not the step of production that they work in, um, it's important that they know uh, why that step is, is important for production of the filter. So you have these employees that uh, know how to make a good looking filter and a high quality filter. They know how to operate a kiln properly. Um, they know how to run quality control tests. Um, and so I think it's important to provide good wages and incentives to retain these employees so that you, you're not losing that information over time. So moving forward uh, to address these challenges, um, Potters for Peace has recently increased their filter coordinator staff time. Um, we still operate um, primarily on volunteer time, um, but we're hoping to, to improve our communication with factories, um, putting out a, uh, a newsletter once or twice a year to factories that can, can do a better job of communicating um, opportunities for those factories uh, in terms of funding uh, conferences to those factories um, and research from the field. So what what is the academic world of the filter taught us in, in that time span? Um, we also hope to have a little better follow-up with new factory requests. Um, we want to expand our options for new factory setup. So we'd like to have better communication between uh, funders and entrepreneurs try to get that local leadership involved uh, early on. Um, we have some new ideas we're pursuing. Uh, we hope to to pursue the idea of a factory in a box, uh, for lack of a better term, <coughs> which is essentially the idea that we can put all of the equipment needed to jumpstart filter production in one container and ship it uh, to a site, um, making it potentially more um, sellable to, to donors, and along with that, develop an improved business plan design that can be used by, by any group who wants to start a filter factory in their community. And then we hope to improve uh, quality control oversight. So we're looking for funding uh, for more follow-up studies for groups that are experiencing issues uh, with quality control at the factory. And of course, we want to support the work of Justine and, and folks at Tufts University in the development of the certification of manufacturing quality control processes. 
And so with that, I'll hand it over to Justine. Um, I think she's going to tell us a little bit more about that certification process. Um, I just threw some filter appraisal up here. Um, and I think we'll take questions after Justine's presentation. So thank you very much for your attention, and, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I hope my screen is, is showing up okay. Thank you for being here, and thank you, Kara, for that, that really good presentation. It's very clear. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit today about... Your screen is not yet showing. Um, let's just figure that out really quickly. There we go. All right. Now you're showing. Okay. Now you have me? Okay. Um, so, but you could hear me, right? We could. Thank you. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about um, the quality control process certification that we're working on for ceramic filter factories. Um, the background is, my slides aren't switching. There we go. Um, to provide a little bit of background, um, in 2008, I carried out a survey of filter manufacturers, and we saw that quality control practices varied not only between different factories, but also within each factory. There was high variability of, of um, consistency of carrying out quality control. Um, so in 2009, the, we formed the Ceramics Manufacturing Working Group, and we uh, put together a set of best practice recommendations for manufacturing ceramic filters. Um, and we're continued to work on quality control. Um, in, two uh, in 2009, when I carried, or 2008, when I carried out this survey, there were about 35 filter factories. And in 2013, um, there were more than 50 ceramic filter factories worldwide. And more than eight organizations and individuals offer technical assistance in setting up factories. So we found that it's become challenging to um, control how or to have feed input into how filters are, how people are being taught how to manufacture filters. Um, so, so as Kara raised, there are some quality control concerns with filters that have been distributed in the field and into users' households. This is a picture of a filter that. Um, was dis or was shipped to Haiti after the earthquake, and um, about a large percentage of the filters in, in the shipment showed up crumbling and cracked and and broken. And so um, there's a real challenge in ensuring that filters like these don't get into um, households. So there are three primary uh, criteria: one is bacteria removal, another is flow rate, and another is strength. And um, uh, Kara has already mentioned a little bit about all three of these. So um, uh, anyway, we genuinely believe that uh, ceramic water, uh, that filter factories want to make a quality product. But um, as Kara mentioned, there can be a loss of knowledge over time, or um, other things can. Uh, there may be a lack of information about uh, appropriate quality control processes. So we um, would like to implement a certification program um, process for ceramic filter factories. Um, and this is coming largely as a demand from both filter factories and NGOs who would like to have more confidence in, in purchasing filters. So what we did was we developed um, a questionnaire and a site assessment form and that was based on the best practice manual. We visited four factories in um, different countries and we discussed the project. We uh, interviewed them about their manufacturing protocol. We observed production and um, documented. We brought filters back to Tufts um, University and we tested them in the laboratory for E. coli removal and silver concentration in the filtered water, among other things. Um, and we are working to further develop um, the uh, certification protocol. Would, this would be based on the theory that if you can, if you manufacture a filter that works, that meets the, our, the criteria, and you make them the same by using some uh, consistent input materials and processing, and when you evaluate them, 
they the they appear they seem consistent, then you can expect that you're making like, you're getting the same results and making a consistent product. Um, so some of the expectations or some of the um, the manufacturing characteristics that we looked into um, or that are outlined in the best practices is um, raw materials and processing, um, ensuring that or ensuring that materials are of consistent quality and if not uh, implementing additional quality assurance and quality control um, uh, procedures. Um, in terms of filter production, uh, the ratio um, and the filter mixture should be consistent and any change in ratio or variation in materials should be verified through microbiological testing to ensure that you are manufacturing a filter, a high quality filter. Um, what we have seen at times in factories is that ratios or manufacturing processes are sometimes altered in order to achieve the flow rate rather than using the flow rate test as a measure of production consistency. Um, uh, during filter manufacturing, it's important that the mold is well aligned so that the filter walls are of consistent thickness. Each filter needs to be stamped with a, a serial number and the logo so that each filter can be traced back to its manufacturing um, uh, conditions. And the filters can be uh, touched up and trimmed to ensure uh, strong rims. Uh, firing is particularly important and it's a big challenge to um, achieve even heat distribution and temperature. Uh, so we encourage that factories um, implement a series of methods to monitor and control the, the firing in order to produce consistent filters. Uh, in terms of quality control, there are several different quality control evaluations that can um, help identify inconsistent materials or methods. Um, and one of the things that we've seen also is that um, not only should these evaluations be carried out, but there needs to be a clear rejection criteria um, for, for filters. So, for example, if only 30% of the filters in a particular batch meet the flow rate criteria, um, they should not be accepted because uh, the, lack, the, the flow rate range should be narrow within a batch. Um, and so at, at, with a 30% um, success rate, it's showing that manufacturing is not well controlled. Um, water quality testing should be carried out on filters in advance of silver application where silver is applied post-firing. Um, it's clear that a lot of factories or that fa factories may need support both in understanding and interpreting laboratory results when they have their filters tested in a lab and in implementing in-house uh, test methods. Where there's a, seri a new, there are several new um, uh, tests that can be used in the field and those have, um, have been really helpful in involving factories and testing their own filters and seeing the results. Um, silver should uh, be applied uh, to filters in order to prevent um, any sort of bacteria or growth on the filter walls. Um, increasingly silver has been shown, uh, silver retention has been shown that it can be affected uh, by the influent water quality, um, so it's important that silver is not relied on as a primary barrier to bacteria getting through. Um, packaging is also important. Kara um, discussed this also. Um, the uh, operation and maintenance instructions should be available both in pictures and in the local language, and the receptacle should be food grade the lid should fit without any gaps and the filter should also fit on the receptacle without gaps that would allow um, untreated water to get into the safe storage container. In terms of health and safety, we also like to uh, think it's very important that, at, that factories take health and safety um, precautions to reduce occupational exposures. 
Um, at, at filter factories, workers are exposed to silica dust in the nature of the processing of the, of the clay. And it's important to implement engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment to, re to reduce um, exposure to various dust um, and other uh, occupational exposures. It's also important that factories have um, water and sanitation facilities for their workers to um, promote healthy hygiene. So overall, if we really sum it down, the manufacturing proposed manufacturing protocol certification would be to look at filters and ensure that the, the filters produced at the factory are meeting a minimum of two log reduction. They should also meet um, flow rate and strength requirements. And that materials and production consistency is controlled throughout the process and it's verified through quality assurance and quality control evaluations. And that factories document their materials and methods so that filters can, manufacturing of every individual filter can be traced back if needed. And also as a form of um, identifying inconsistencies during production and that health and safety precautions be in place. Um, so with that, the next steps in the process is to establish a committee that can review um, both these documentations and also participate in um, certifying filter factories. And um, then we need to get some funding and then pilot uh, this, the process and implement it. Um, in the future, what, what is missing in this, in this process right now is um, criteria and methods for evaluating filter strength. And so that's something that we're looking forward to um, in, including in this um, process in the future. Uh, high quality filters, but that there's a need for additional support and um, and um, there's a need for additional uh, support in implementing, um, developing and implementing uh, good quality control procedures. And so we'd like to work together with factories um, to support them in this. So I wanted to say thanks so much to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for supporting this work and to everyone who invited me into their factories and, and also contributed to the development, development of this work. And thank you. And any feedback or questions, I am happy to take them. Um, and I think that's it. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Justine. Uh, and I'll have Justine and Kara turn on their webcams as well uh, for the question and answer part. And I'd like to start with a question that uh, applies to both of your presentations. And for Kara, it's kind of thinking about potential innovations or changes in um, the filter to increase its capabilities. And for Justine, it's about, um, I don't think I want to switch on the screen. Um, for Justine, it's about the communication of these quality control procedures. Uh, so someone asked, how are these issues, changes, plans communicated uh, to factories or to other stakeholders? What are the methods that you use to be in touch with uh, filter producers, filter users? Um, well, primarily through email and Google Groups. So we can post information, news, and updates in, a, in a Google Groups. And then I have a distribution list that I send out to filter factories when there's new information or um, when we're hosting, holding an event or something like that. Um, there's also other Facebook and uh, Kara, were you about to speak? Yeah, Facebook is a good one to point out. Also, um, Potters Without Borders does a great job of uh, involving people on their Facebook page. Um, and also, like I mentioned, we hope to, to start sending out um, a newsletter either annually or biannually um, to all filter factories and, and try to improve that communication uh, between Potters for Peace and, and the filter factories. Great. And I'll follow up with you guys to get links for that Facebook group and then perhaps for how to join the Google group so that anyone who's interested can follow up with that. Um, and 
I'd also like to thank everyone who's been helping to answer the questions as they arise in the chat function during the uh, during the presentation. So thanks for helping to get those answered. Um, there were a number of questions about um, silver, uh, both during the presentations and also submitted before. Um, one of them is is reapplication of the silver ever necessary? <clears throat> Here, um, sure, I can take that one. So as Justine mentioned, there's a little bit of recent research that indicates that uh, the water quality parameters, such as uh, chlorine content, pH of the water, uh, dissolved solids in the water might aff affect silver leaching. So this, of course, is going to affect the uh, lifetime of the silver in your filter. So I think, um, I think yes, silver application uh, could be a useful thing if, if filters are not cracked and someone can bring them back to the factory for application. Um, but I think first we need to know more about um, how all of these different water quality parameters can affect um, the, the leaching of the silver over time. So once we have a better grasp on that, um, we might be able to, to, to make recommendations more specifically about when reapplication might be necessary. And then, Justine, you mentioned, I believe it was Justine, um, measuring residual silver in, like, after treatment. Um, but one question was, is it possible to quantify the colloidal silver in the filters? Um, that's probably better for a silver expert to answer. Um, it's, uh, you can, what we have done in our silver testing in the past is measured how much silver we've applied and how much silver has come out okay. um, and then subtracted it, but I'm not sure of a, um, of a way, you know, for example, in the, I, I don't think there's a way in the field to know how much silver is left in your filter. Right. I think, I think it probably could be done, but it'd be a destructive procedure. Yeah. Okay. And then some questions about operation and maintenance are just, is there internal clogging of the pores over time is a, a basic question that one person asked. And then how can you uh, clean the filter to kind of prolong its lifetime and prevent this clogging? Um, so I can take that one. Um, turbid water does clog the pores over time. Um, so if you are using a, a turbid source, we, we do recommend uh, pre-filtering. Um, some factories provide a, a filter, a pre-filter that can actually fit inside the filter, um, but you can also use just a t-shirt or, or a piece of cloth over the filter to pre-filter um, water. Um, if you do see a slowing of the flow rate, you can also use a laundry brush uh, to scrub the inside of the filter, and that can rejuvenate flow rate. Um, it is important, however, to make sure that there are no chemicals on uh, the laundry brush that would then get into the filter and, and interact negatively with the silver. Um, but, but you can restore to a point the flow rate using a, a laundry brush. Okay. Great. Um, and Justine, a question about quality control. Uh, one registrant asked about the international organization for standardization um, and whether it would be possible to implement that style of manufacturing quality control in a decentralized system like this. Um, would it be practical and affordable? And I guess, have you looked to the ISO at all in developing your um, methods? And yeah, um, there is actually one factory that is ISO certified in China and um, they, you know, when they've been through that process and they thought it was a good process and I think we're modeling ours very similar to that similarly to that um, one of the things I guess is that I feel like we're somewhat it's going to be somewhat customized to each factory because each factory will need to develop their own certification or sorry their own um, quality control procedures depending on um, their equipment and their materials and, and things like that um, so, but yeah, I think we're, our model is, is following the same principles as the ISO certification. Okay, great. And then a couple questions about um, setting up a filter factory. Uh, one question was, how long does it take to set up a production line and bring it to full functionality and capacity? And then also, kind of what costs are you looking at there on the order, on an order of magnitude when it comes to setting up a factory? 
Sure. Uh, most of the time, time-consuming portion of uh, starting a new factory is uh, building the infrastructure, acquiring the equipment, uh, getting the funding put together. Um, so in terms of the, the actual initiation of production, once all of the equipment uh, is in place in a factory, it only takes about five weeks generally to build the kiln and, uh, and come up with a good working filter ratio, uh, ratio of burnout material to clay. Um, so that can be done in about five weeks. Um, but the funding uh, is, is really the thing that's going to affect uh, most of all how long it takes to initiate production. Mm -hmm. um, funding really can range uh, pretty broadly in terms of what's needed to start a filter factory. Um, it's been done for uh, $30,000 and it's been done for $250,000. Um, so I think that's dependent on what, what type of production uh, you're looking at starting with. Um, if you already have land and infrastructure available or if you have to purchase that um, and, and uh, who your funders are, um, where you're able to start. So, so there's quite a range, um, but if, it can be done um, for about $30,000. Okay, great, thank you. And then Justine, I saw that you, you mentioned pressure testing on one of your slides. One question is, um, just wants to talk a little more about pressure testing and asks if there's any academic work that's being pursued to promote uh, the use of pressure testing over flow rate testing for quality control and a question as to whether it might be better correlated to bacterial uh, reduction than flow rate testing. I'm not aware of any um, of any academic investigations into pressure testing. Um, I do think that it's a good quality control um, evaluation to carry out on all filters. I don't think it's um, something that should replace flow rate testing, however. So um, uh, I think it would be interesting to see if there are some, if there's good correlation between pressure testing and bacteriological uh, removal. That would be a really good area for future research. Okay. Um, and then there are a couple of questions about the addition of other things besides silver to the filters. So one is, uh, I'll just ask both of them and then have you address them um, together. So one is, could charcoal be added to the ceramic filter uh, when it comes to heavy metal removals? And the second is, have you considered the addition of synthetic, small synthetic fibers to improve initial strength and long-term durability? So one is more removal focused and one is more durability focused. Justine, you want to take that or? Um, yeah, uh, I, so sorry, was the question more has this research um, been done or? Uh, yeah, so the first question was really just about addition of charcoal. I don't know if it's research or whether it just simply it could be added. Um, I guess you need to know if research had been done to know if that's, that is effective. Um, and then the second, I think, would be more research focused about improving strength of the filters. Yeah, so in terms of charcoal, um, uh, it's activated charcoal that uh, is effective in, in, in uh, improving the water quality. And, um, and, it's some, it, and it expires. It gets. It becomes saturated. So I think you could add something. It doesn't even. It wouldn't need to be. You know, even as a part, a, like integral part of the filter. But it could be in the filter, in some way, maybe as a coating or something like that. Um, but it's something that would need to be replaced, and so it would end up um, reducing or reactivated, and so it would end up reducing the lifespan of the filter, which is, I think, is one of the challenges in including charcoal in it. In terms of um, adding fibers for strength, um, there is someone who works uh, with paper clay and wants and is very interested in, in incorporating paper into ceramic filters um, to see if that helps improve both bacteriological effectiveness and strength of filters. Um, but I'm not sure where research stands on that right now. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I know there are also some efforts to um, improve things like virus removal with uh, copper and, and silver treatments. Yeah. Um, there's some work with titanium dioxide. Um, there's also some work being done with removal of fluoride and arsenic um, using uh, 
uh, coatings of the filter, but to my knowledge, none of these have um, have entered a, a phase where they can actually be implemented in the field. It's all it's all still in the trial phases uh, in the laboratory. Okay, great. Okay, and then kind of one final question before we wrap up, just being aware of people's time. Um, for the certification process, uh, do you envision that it will expire after a certain number of years? What's the plan for kind of long-term look at certification? So what we're looking at right now, and it's um, it, you know it's a process that's going to evolve, and we'll figure out what's the best way to do it. But right now we're thinking that um, a factory could be certified maybe for a year um, if they or for two years if after one year they send some documentation to show um, that they're, you know, to, to update us on how they're manufacturing their filters and the quality of the filters coming out. Um, but that can evolve over time depending on what the community needs and um, what we feel is an effective, you know, amount of time or an appropriate amount of time. Okay. And besides, you mentioned that one factory in China is ISO certified. Have any of the other 50 or so factories been certified, whether it's through the piloting of your process or through another certification process? I think there are some factories who have been certified by national, um, national standards boards, uh, but I don't know of any factories that have, uh, any other factories that have done ISO certification. And our process, our protocol hasn't been, um, hasn't been finalized yet, so we haven't actually we haven't certified any factories yet. Okay. So we're hoping to yep. do that in 2016. Potters for Peace recommends that the the Ministry of Health in each uh, each country try and uh, certify the the or the filter factory go to the Ministry of Health for certification, um, but that's up to the individual filter factories. Okay. And that's where some of the demand is coming from, also in terms of setting up. Uh, this procedure is because some fact uh, some countries don't have um, a procedure in place, and so they're looking for guidance in terms of uh, what to look for or something like that. And factories find it would be helpful to have some sort of certification seal to um, improve the confidence for the buyers, filter buyers. Great. Okay. Uh, well, thanks to you both. I assume that it would be okay for me to also include your contact information for anyone who wants to follow up directly? Mm-hmm. Please do. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And so just kind of as a review, um, so we will be sending up a follow-up email uh, within the next week that includes a recording to the webinar along with the presentations and any of the relevant supporting materials, whether it's how to find the Facebook group uh, that Kara mentioned or the Google group that Justine mentioned. Um, so that will all be included in the email along with uh, their contact information and relevant cost supporting materials. And then finally, if you want to learn more about the ceramic pot filter or any other household water treatment and safe storage technologies and products, please feel free to visit our newly developed household water treatment and safe storage knowledge base. Um, and feel free to email me if you have any questions, comments, or feedback on that. Um, and again, any questions that weren't answered today, we'll work with Kara and Justine and make sure that those get answered. And so with that, I just want to thank everyone for joining us um, and enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks so much again, Kara and Justine, for teaching us more about ceramic pot filters and quality control. Um, Thanks and with for that, having me. Thank you. Ciao.